Hello, and welcome to another Saturday food support group. Um, we have these Zoom meetings every Saturday at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. And um, I just invite people to come and to share their stories because I've had so many people reach out to me um, in private messages and tell me their stories. And uh, I just couldn't keep it for myself. I had to share with you all of the beautiful things that are happening when people break their addiction to sugar and carbs and processed food. Um, and they get their brains back, they get their bodies back, they get their lives back. Um, and they're just so excited that they can't wait to tell. Um, and so I informed everyone that I would be recording these meetings and I encouraged them that if they wanted to remain anonymous that they can turn the camera off um, but a lot of people just, they want to share. They want to share what has happened to them. And they're so excited about their new life. <laughs> um, and then I also open it up for questions. If people are, are still struggling and they're still on this journey, um, that they can come and, and ask questions. But if you need more individualized care than just in a group like this, feel free to email me at innerclaritysystem at gmail.com and I'll walk you through what it looks like to work with me one-on-one. -on -one. All right, thanks. I hope you enjoy the group. Hello, happy Saturday. We have another Saturday food support group where we just come and get together and talk about things. We had a pre-meeting conversation that involved the carnivore code. Vicki is holding that up. Um, the book by Paul Saladino, The Carnivore Code. And we had a question from uh, Becky who said, um, you know, I'm just kind of confused about all of these ideas of um, adding in, um, adding in um, fruit um, and being concerned about oxalates and who do you listen to? and all of this sort of stuff. So um, here's my two cents um, when it comes down to all of this stuff. That book is actually a really good book. Um, and it has some really phenomenal stuff. And Paul Saladino has some really phenomenal, phenomenal stories um, and phenomenal, uh, uh, you know, th information for us to uh, continue to have uh, really the information that we need. But um, as everybody in the carnivore community knows, Paul Saladino has shifted from what he wrote in that book. Um, and what I am seeing on the front lines <laughs> with my clients is that they have this addiction that we know it's an addiction. We see it's an addiction and their addictive mind is looking for a loophole. Their addictive mind is going, what? I can have blueberries? I can have strawberries? I can have apples? I can have pears? Oh my gosh. And so then they open that door and then they go and they fall down the carb hole. They spiral and it literally takes over their mind because fruit is sugar and sugar wrecks some people, not everybody, but there's some people that it literally makes them crazy. Um, yeah, Vicki's raising her hand. I'll definitely have you weigh in on this in a minute, Vicki. Um, but it, it literally changes their mind, especially whenever people are, are dealing with some, uh, you know, mental illnesses. Um, it, it, it triggers something some sort of an imbalance. And then it's not just that little moment. It's not just that little bit of fruit. It's like, it opens this gateway to, Ooh, if I can have fruit, maybe I can have this. And if I can have this, maybe I can have that. And then it's just, and then all of a sudden they're back to the standard American diet for some people, not a problem. They are fine. They have this little blip. They get right back on for some people it wrecks them and literally possesses them. They have these in, in, uh, in, invasive, invasive thoughts that just control their behavior. Um, and, and it's like impossible to shut it off. And the only way to shut it off is to stop eating the sugar. 
So Amy, I would like for you to weigh in on, um, on that. Okay. I put my doggies inside because too much energy. Seriously. I was like, they keep going after the chickens. This isn't going to work. Okay. So I can explain the physiology behind why some people cannot do sugar. I don't care if it's natural sugar from berries or if it's honey or if it's even the sugar in say yogurt. For a lot of people who have any form of mental illness, now this can include ADHD or just anxiety, depression, all the way to schizophrenia, bipolar, all of it. If you have anything mental, what we're finding and what we're seeing is the reason that you have problems is because of the high amount of insulin that is found in your brain. Because we know that when we overconsume carbs, it raises our insulin. And when that happens, for some people, your brain actually begins to starve and die. So people who have um, Alzheimer's, their brain scans can look similar to those that have bipolar. There's the same dead spots in the brain that aren't working anymore. And that's simply from the inundation, that's not a word, the uh, too much insulin in their brain itself. So they have those dead spots. When we go on a lower carb diet, low carb and or carnivore, that slowly begins to heal. Our insulin level falls. And so our brain can actually come back it can grow again, it can reawaken and connect those neural pathways that have been disrupted. For some people, when you go back to the berries or the yogurt or the honey or the fruit that is safe for some people, what that does is your insulin has to respond. That's what our bodies are created to do. When you eat those carbs, the insulin's gonna go up. For some of us, when that insulin goes up and it comes and it hits our brain, our brain actually has developed PTSD from high insulin. And your brain, I learned this in Dr. Boz's brains course, and I've listened to quite a few of her other, um, her other talks about brains. Go that, ahead. That Amy, you didn't just um, listen to it online. You didn't just read a book. You physically drove to Pella, Iowa, another state, and you went through a 12 hour course. So it, it, it wasn't just like, I read an article from Dr. Boz, like you literally physically went and learned and underneath her. So go ahead. Yes. And, and so you actually get PTSD, a PTSD response. Your brain physically dies and shrinks up and shrivels up again almost immediately. Now, I tried this. I can speak from experience. I was being told, oh, well, your hair is falling out because you need more carbs. You know, and obviously what you're doing isn't working. So you need more carbs and you're getting more depressed and you're tired and you must not be using ketones. So you have to include some carbs back again. So I did it. For five days, I did the real, true, organic, natural honey with no corn syrup. And I did berries and I did the yogurt and I did all of that, all organic, all natural or from my own property. And I tried it on the fifth day. I was sitting outside my bedroom working on my computer and my husband walked out and he said, Hey babe, what's for dinner? And I lost it. I started bawling. I was like, I don't know what's for dinner. I haven't thought about it. I have a horrible wife. And he looks at me and he goes, and we're done. There is no more. We're not doing this anymore. So I was like, why on earth did it affect me so much? It doesn't make any sense. I found that out from Dr. Boz. And she was like, that's why you can't. She's like, some people will never be able to go back to these carbs. And a lot of it has to do with mental illness and the actual physical damage to your brain during your injury. And she asked me, she was like, you know, when, when did you have your first brain injury? 
when I was recording with her um, from my, our YouTube video we did together. And I said, well, I've never had a, a brain injury. And she said, when did you have your first symptoms of depression? And I said, well, I went on birth control when I was 13. And she said, that was your first brain injury. Because that's said, depression, you were suicidal. Yes. Depression is an actual physical brain injury. And she was like, you've been dealing with this since you were 13. I was like, my mind is blown. <laughs> like everything she said had so much truth to it. And I finally understood where the brain fog came from and the lethargy and the extreme cravings. Because the other part of this is that when you get that, that hit of sugar, it lights up the dopamine receptors of your brain. So you get this euphoria, you're high for a little bit. And then when you crash, you crash hard. And every time you eat more and more and more of that, it kills a little bit more of your brain every single time it dies off again. So then you have to overcome that. And once you're done with it. So I understand why Paul said it wasn't working for him. And I have my own theories about it, but Paul never suffered from mental illness, a debilitating mental illness. He never had the same type of brain injury. So what works for him living where he lives, having access to the fruit and the veggies that he has access to that we don't is a different story. So that is like the physical aspect of why that happens for some of us. So for anybody that I work with that has ever had a mental illness, I tell them, nope. I'm like, you can try it, but be aware of this. This is what has the potential to happen. And I want you to be very honest and open with yourself and with me so that if you choose to do it, we can see what happens. And sometimes that's the only way to get them to stop is because they want to dabble just a little bit, just a little bit. And then finally they'll try it and they will have a massive meltdown epic. They're like, maybe I need medicine again. I'm like, no, 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 no. You need to remove the poison. It's as simple as that. So, and then do you want me to talk about oxalates too? Or do you want to? Yeah, go. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to have to move out of the sun though. It's getting in my way. Hang on. I'm going to, I'm going to take you guys with me here for a second. Well, while you're doing that, I will say that it is interesting that it is like a PTSD response. Um, and the way that I think about it, and I know that this isn't necessarily PTSD, but whenever you have a first pregnancy and your body like goes into that shape of, of having the baby. And then, um, whenever you go into the second pregnancy, it's like your body remembers and goes pop. Like it pops quicker. I mean, it, it, you'll be like three months pregnant. And then all of a sudden you look like you're six to seven months pregnant. And so I, I picture that that's what your brain does goes, Oh, that's right. I remember being crazy. Yeah. We're yeah. We're going to go right back there. We're going to go right back to the worst part and we're going to push it a little bit and we're going to be a little bit more crazier. And that's why it's so dangerous sometimes to, to, to really, um, experiment and, and, and mess with this stuff a little bit too much. The addictive mind is so brilliant. I mean, it is the, the, the father of lies. <laughs> I mean, it literally sits like the, the, you know, the cartoons, like the little devil on your shoulder and the angel on your shoulder. And so that's why I, I do this work with inner clarity system, because you literally have to get that, um, almost like a, like learning a new language and you have to learn to listen and hear the dialect of the voices in your head to know, Oh, that's the devil talking to me. That's not my inner clarity. That's not my knowing that's not the truth. And so we're so easily deceived by these tricky little things that that's why it's so important to be in a group. It's so important to have these conversations, to, to be vulnerable. And like Emily just was to say, Hey, this happened to me. 
you know, and I can guarantee you that that little voice is going to have a lot harder time convincing Emily next time because she said it out loud. She said it out loud instead of like being trapped in your thoughts and she was able to put it out into the world. And now it's even recorded <laughs> um, to, to say that um, that wasn't right. That wasn't true. That wasn't right. And I know better because Emily, you do, you know, if, if you didn't know, you wouldn't be here today. Mm -hmm. So yep. thank you. Thank you so much for sharing. And that relapse was a vulner or a valuable lesson for me because it prompted me to open up with my therapist, put together like an addiction recovery plan and take it a lot more seriously because before I was just like, oh, I need to lose weight. Like it was always the weight. I was focused on that. And now it's like, I'm an addict. And if I were an alcoholic, I would be taking this very seriously. And the weight would be sort of like a pleasant side effect but the focus would be on addiction treatment. And so that's where my research, that's where my energy is going now because of that relapse. And if I hadn't had that, maybe I wouldn't be taking it so seriously. Maybe I wouldn't even be here today. So I'm thankful in a weird way that it happened. If mm. that makes sense. Oh my gosh. I just had this conversation with Amy. I'm sorry. I'm going to tell y'all my example. I believe that <laughs> everything happens for a reason and that we need the bad to embrace the good and to really relish and to feel the light. We have to have the darkness. And for the longest time, I kept getting so mad at the mess ups. I kept getting so mad at the mental illness. I get so mad at the physical illness. And why is this happening? And this sucks. And this is horrible. But now I recognize that that's what gave me the muscles that I needed to walk in this. It's like if I hadn't gone through the muck, I wouldn't have these strong leg muscles to walk through that mud to get to where I'm at now. And so I now embrace the suck. I now uh, appreciate the bad parts because they teach me. I have not had one bad experience that has not taught me something profound that I have been able to use for good. So thank you so much for that example, Emily. Yeah, we were talking about that yesterday and, and I was like, oh, I love that picture. Cause it's like everything that you've been through, all the crap and the suck, you make these bricks out of it and you can do one of two things. You can use it to climb higher or you can let it crush you. You got to figure out which one you are going to use it for because you are in control of that, that brick, whether or not you let it crush you, or if you're going to use it to climb on top and take you upwards and onwards as a motorcycle drives by. Um, so Emily, that was fantastic. Thank you for sharing and for being vulnerable. Um, I know that's why we share our stories and we're vulnerable because then it allows other people to see I'm not alone. So I know that you will help someone with that. Thank you for that. Um, back to the previous topic. <laughs> Oxalates. Oxalates. Here we go. Okay. Oxalates are funny because they really divide people. There's a lot of people in this space who are like, oxalates are the devil. They will kill you. And then there's a lot of other people that are like, it's an excuse to blame on anything you don't understand. And as someone who has dealt with oxalates, I, I used to be one of those people that I was like, um, oxalates are just an excuse for things you don't understand. Like fibromyalgia. We don't know why you're chronically in pain. So we're going to name it this. And it sounds cool. It's the same thing. Oxalates. Oh, plants hurt you. Woo. Um, I used to think that I was like, oxalates aren't really a thing. Until I had my very first, second, third, and 17th run-in with nasty oxalates. Uh, the first of which would be my husband ended up starting to throw kidney stones when we went keto. Now, when we did keto originally, it was almond flour, everything, almond milk. I was literally eating eight cups of spinach a day because it was one can of spinach plus another four cups of raw spinach 
in my smoothie with almond butter, which is all very, very, very high in oxalate. Uh, so Richard ended up throwing kidney stones, extreme pain. Um, they st- we started getting styes really bad. Some people can actually develop heart disease because of oxalates. Now there's a lot of people who don't want to admit this, but that's, I truly believe because they have not had a close encounter themselves with these oxalates. Now there are some people who could literally live on nothing but oxalates, detox them fine and move on with life and have a fantastic day. There's other people who have actually died from over consuming oxalates. Uh, There's uh, this classic tale of this guy who had three bowls of sorrel soup. What's that? Died. It's a green, it's like a oh. leafy green, you know, cause we all say that leafy greens are so good for us. Yeah. He had three bowls of this soup and it probably had potatoes in it, which potatoes are extremely high in oxalate. So even if you don't eat potatoes now, if you used to eat a whole lot of potatoes, you may have a lot of oxalate build up in you. It just kind of depends but they can cause so many problems for certain people. I'm a really big believer in follow your gut. If you think that oxalates could be a problem for you, then you need to trust that inner clarity, that feeling, that gut that's telling you, I think you might be one of those people. I don't care what anybody else says. I love Dr. Robert Siwes. He is a genius in many aspects. However, he is not God. He does not know everything. And if he hasn't personally encountered this for himself, it's not going to be the same. And so I followed my gut. I was like, I think I might have an idea of what's wrong with this. It's the oxalates. Now I can handle a whole lot more than my husband can, like a whole lot more. But we looked into it, we figured it out, and now we know how we can each eat individually. But I have heard of people that have had oxalate toxicity and they've developed heart disease, they've had heart attacks. And when they had their biopsies, there was oxalates in those calcification. And and the reason that that happens is that oxalates are a toxin and they bind to minerals in our bodies, usually calcium. And the calcium and the oxalate combo can get lodged different places in your body. It can end up in your joints. You get gout, your kidneys, kidney stones, or in your heart, causing these calcifications around your heart and in your arteries. So they would open them up and they would find that there are oxalates in their heart disease. And they were like, oh, so listen to your gut. If you think you have a problem with oxalates, go with it. I don't care what anyone else says. Because in the end, you're the one that is responsible for your own health. You hire these doctors and they work for you. So you can continue doing research. Sally K. Norton, um, she's working on a book, but it won't be out till December this year, unfortunately. But she does have her own webpage. So I encourage you to do more research on the oxalates because in my personal experience, they really are a thing. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's why I have these, you know, the food support group and I don't buy into anything, um, because it all depends. It all depends. It's so individual. I can't sit here and say, um, you know, carnivore is the way. And the only way that you can do this is if you eat carnivore keto is the way, the only way you can do this is if you eat keto, Almond milk is the way almond flour is the way I, I can't say that because everybody is so individual and so different. What I can say is that you have an inner knowing that you need to tap into and you need to do what you can to clear out the noise. And as you clear out the noise, it's like these different levels where at first there's just absolute chaos when you're eating sugar and and processed foods. So we can agree on that. Sugar and processed foods need to go. So as you remove those, you get this clarity and you get this knowing, like Amy said, where you're just like, I think oxalates might be a problem for me. Then 
go down that rabbit hole, use that as a, a, a guidance that's directing you to that. So, um, Vicki, I would love for you to share with us, um, what your experience was with the fruit. Um, so do you mind sharing Vicki, um, what your experience was? Yeah. Um, so I have a, a dairy goat farm and in my front yard is an orchard. Now you might visualize the orchard with rows of all these trees, but it's not like that. Uh, I have apple trees, pear trees, plum trees. I have one plum tree and then I have a bunch of blueberry bushes. I have blackberry. And so my plum bush this year, my plum tree, not bush, sorry. It actually produced way more plums this year than it ever has. <laughs> and I'm like, it figures, you know, since I'm on carnivore. And so I decided to go ahead and eat two. And um, now, you know, the ones in the store are big, you know, genetic modified, minor, not like that. Um, where I live is actually had been a bigger, much bigger orchard at one time, all planted by my father-in-law. And so, um, anyway, I ate two and, you know, I just didn't have a good reaction. I had swelling. Um, I, it made my back of my throat numb. Now I am allergic to pineapple and cats and I carry an EpiPen for that. And so, um, I actually thought I was going to have to end up using my EpiPen. Well, my blueberry bush had come into, you know, is huge, you know, so, I had ate a handful of blueberries. And so after eating a handful of blueberries, um, number one, I had a hypoglycemic reaction. And so, which is not good. I used to fight that always with protein and peanut butter. I used to carry a jar of peanut butter in my car because the hypoglycemic reactions happen so often. And if I, that, you know, you got the people that would tell you to fight it with crackers or candy. Well, that would just be a roller coaster ride for me. So I tried to always fight it with back in the day with her. Um, but so it hasn't happened to me since I've been carnivore. And so I just, you know, it, it was not good. And then all of a sudden I started having cravings. I mean, just terrible, terrible cravings to where I mean I was just crying. I felt like an alcoholic. You know, that I wanted something so bad and pray God I don't have anything in my house. But when I left to go to my chiropractor, acupuncturist, all I kept thinking about is food. I thought about going to, I don't know if you guys have a Biscuitville where you're from, but I thought about going through Biscuitville and getting a chicken biscuit. Um, I don't like biscuits and their chicken is terrible. So what? <laughs> you know, it was stupid stuff going through my mind. I thought about going and getting an ice cream custard. And I thought about going and getting this and that. You know, all along the way, I was mapping out in my head where all I was going to be passing by that I could get me something. And I thought, this is, you know, I just, I was very angry. And I mean, I was crying. I was mad because you know, I haven't had this. Today's day 170 of carnivore. And I hadn't, I hadn't had this till I ate that stupid fruit, <laughs> you know, and it's just like, ah, so, I mean, it was a good week, week and a half of just dealing with this craving. And I just thought this is, it made me very upset with myself that I did that. So um, yesterday I went out to my blueberry bush and I picked six pounds of blueberries and I did, um, I haven't. All with and get your bare way. hands with your bare hands like I, yeah. I was super impressed by that like you literally touched your poison <laughs> and did but, not put it in your mouth exactly and you know, what's crazy is when I would pick the ones that were so big and juicy looking my first thought was just one won't hurt but then all of a sudden my body I felt like I was having a hypoglycemic reaction. I know that sounds ridiculously crazy, nope. but I went through the same feeling that I was going through when I went through the hypoglycemic reaction. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. And it made me really think back to when I quit smoking years ago, but you know, that was just hundred percent God. I quit cold Turkey 
Um, and, you know, because my mom had a congestive heart failure, my dad had a congestive heart failure, my mom died at 64 of cancer, you know, it's like so much stuff. I thought I got, I have got to quit smoking. And of course I was morbidly obese at five foot one and 270 pounds. And so, you know, I saw a heart attack waiting to happen. And so anyway, um, but how I had quit smoking was it just, every time I thought about a cigarette in my mind's eye, I thought I could see my arteries clogging up. And I mm. could just see it happening, clogging up with black. And um, so I just, I just didn't have a desire for it because I just knew what would happen if I continued on that route. So it kind of reminded me of that when I was out there picking the blueberries yesterday. And I was so proud of myself. It's just so amazing. I mean, I just, wow. But I did come inside and I did make some flank and ribs and three egg yolks. <laughs> and so, because I still wanted to eat that one, you know, but even though I kept having this reaction that made me feel like I was having a hypoglycemic reaction, I, I knew, okay, how can I stop this? How can I help this? How can I put a roadblock in front of this? I need to eat. And so I ate yeah, a flan rib and three egg yolks. Um, I don't eat egg whites because it causes me inflammation. So I don't know if that's one of my autoimmune disease or if it's the Hashimoto. I don't know. But I don't do that. But anyway, um, awesome. I did want to think about oxalate. Okay. Um, okay. So after eating the blueberries this week, I'm back to having a all over my face. Which the I have what? makeup on to try to cover it. I have a rash oh. on my face from eating the fruit, but um, like all along my hairline, it's just like I have bumps everywhere, and um, I have I've had what people have told me is oxalate dumping is everything I've read and looked up, but um, I've had like splinters, what looks like splinters coming out of my skin, yep. and so. Yesterday, I felt something and I thought, oh crap, I got a pick. <laughs> and I looked and it wasn't. I had to get a pair of tweezers and pull this thing out of me that looked like a barb. But yep. it, was, it looked kind of like a hair, but it was, it was, I don't Hard. know. It was very strange. And so I've had those things coming out of me. I've had the rashes all over and, you know, a lot of rash behind my left ear I have no idea why the left ear but um and so you know I had looked up all this stuff on how long you do that and I've heard other people Kelly Hogan said she never had oscillate dumping so but you know when I was keto I ate a lot of broccoli cauliflower a lot of um a lot of spinach and romaine so I ate a lot of leafy greens so I could only, you know, assume that I'm having a, a lot of this because of that. But it seems like since I ate the fruit, that it's intensified mm. and my rashes are back. Um, the face looks like acne, but it's not. I, I thought I was having some acne about a month or so ago. And then whenever what I thought was a pimple broke open, what came out of it was look like a rock yep so weird so, wow but well I you know my, like I said my first book that I read was Paul Saladino's book and of course I eat kosher that's why you know the kosher carnivore here but so you know of course half the stuff I wouldn't touch anyway that he recommended but um you know it really helped me to get started Yes. And it, so it's a I good book. On, it is a good book. And I don't, you know, I don't care for how he's gone. Um, I unfollowed him on Instagram, but, um, you know, I don't hate the guy. He helped no. me. And, you know, I got Dr. Baker's book. Yes. That's a good <laughs> you one. So, you know, every book I could get a hold of, I got a hold of and read. And, um, but, you know, I would say everybody has a lot of good information, but our addictive personalities, some of us, especially me, um, would want to say, well, he said, I can eat this. 
Uh, yeah, so, you can always it, find you can always find the voice saying what you want to do. You can always find right. the doctor that says eat honey. Um, yeah. You can yeah. find the doctor that says it's okay to eat donuts. You can find that doctor. It's just that addictive mind. And what I love about your story is that um, you really had had that experience of the peace from the voices of the cravings that you, it was silent. You were satisfied. You were fine. You were. And then, so it was so obvious when those voices came back that, yeah. you know, you need this, you need this. Why don't you try this? You know, those cravings that literally like tormented you. I remember you messaging me like, what is this? <laughs> like, oh my gosh. <laughs> So thank you so much, Vicki, for sharing your story. I thank really you. appreciate it. Um, we, I, I don't mean to cut this conversation off, but we have um, an incredible story. Um, she was a little bit late, but um, Sally, I would love for you to share with everybody what your experience has been like. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Um, it's like, I can relate to all these things. And like when that voice comes in, um, sometimes I'll have a day and all of a sudden I'm going okay, I want to stop at this place and pick up this and stop at this place and pick up this and stop at this place. And then I'll stop myself and I'll be like, okay, what has happened today? What, what's going on? And I realized I was triggered. There was some emotion. Um, and sometimes part of the healing process itself is everything that was buried before starts coming up. And when that emotion rises, it's like, all it just needs is to be acknowledged it's like, okay, mm. I understand what you are. It's like, but you can go now, you know, it's like, and letting it go. Um, the first thing you want to do is grab, you know, Cadbury eggs or <laughs> whatnot, because you just want to bury it again. And it's like, but I'm 17 months in, so there's no way in hell that's, <laughs> that's happening. Um, but to get to that point, I mean, I couldn't, I lived on sugar. I, it, it just, I don't know. I went months and months without any kind of protein. And I've learned in my research that my brain, my central nervous system needed, um, it needs the saturated fats. It needs the amino acids. And I never, I wasn't giving it that. And so I woke up one day with sciatica mm. and it debilitated me for two years. I couldn't, I woke, I couldn't walk for six weeks and I was in the hospital. What? Yeah. I was in the hospital and I'm like, I'm like this. And, um, at one point they gave me a dilated full dose of dilated. And I'm still kind of like this. They give me another dose and I, I was gone. And next thing I know I'm waking up, my chest is hurting. I've been Narcan and there are 50 doctors around screaming, like what the hell happened? She came in here for her leg and I can't have that allotted apparently. And so I, I learned that, but no one would talk to me. No one would say a word about what happened. Of course, they don't want to get sued. And I just wanted to know what happened. And it happened three more times until I finally got dilated, put on as an allergy because it wouldn't listen to me. I would go in and they'd immediately want to give me this thing. And of course, I'm dying. <laughs> what, what is dilated? What kind of a, a medication? It's a severe painkiller. And they okay. said, the only thing that works. And I looked at the woman, I'm like, um, I can't have that. She goes, but it's the only thing that's going to work. You got to. And I went, I can't have it. And I says, and she goes, well, what happens? I went, I stopped breathing. She goes, well, you have to have it. I'll give you a half a dose. I said, do not leave the room. And so she gave me a half a dose. And next thing I know, I'm being Narcan, the chest and a doctor's in there. And she's like, I don't know what happened. I only gave her half a dose. And I looked, I went, I told you I can't have it. And so, of course, at that point, it became, I made sure it was an allergy on my chart. But anyway, I, two years, I was on mega doses of ibuprofen, gabapentin, um, and Percocet. And round the clock, I set my what and my phone and it would every eight hours even through sleep because I couldn't let the pain get ahead of me and I did that and then the only thing that worked I mean I had PT once in the hospital I had it outside of the hospital and they're looking at me, they're like we're making this worse and everything just it was so inflamed and 
I, the, I did chiropractic, acupuncture, you name it, everything made it worse. And I finally was told I do energy work. So I understood that it could help, but I just couldn't do it on me. I could do it on everybody else. I could yeah. help one in the you world. You but can't I, help yourself. Yeah. Right. So, um, a friend of mine recommended a woman and she very spiritual woman. And so I went to her, she brought my pain from a 10 to a two. I mean, I had to go every single week and, but I was still on all the meds and I said this it's working, but I need to be off these meds. And, but what happened, I started falling asleep. I mean, I was doing this before, but I'd sit down, I'd fall asleep. I couldn't drive longer than 20 minutes. And even then, as soon as I got in the car, I'd be doing this all the way to where I had to go. And it was horrible. I'd fall asleep at work. Now I'm a teacher. (laughs) It's like, you sit down and fall asleep. So I'd be walking around and um, it was horrible. So when that started happening, I was like, okay, it's been nine months on the Percocet. I said, that's the first to go. I don't even like it. Boom. I cut it cold turkey. Not a thing. Not a thing happened. And I, I was taking around the clock for nine months. And my therapist now says, she goes, you'll never be a drug addict. She goes, you'll never be an alcoholic. She goes, but sugar, she goes, that is your vice. And Ooh. so I got off of that. I, I had surgery. There was, there was no choice in the matter. And I cried right before I went in because I, I was scared to death. They did surgery. It took another- On the, on the sciatic nerve? Yeah, they went into my spine and they had to open up the canal because the, the nerve didn't have any space. It was inflamed. Oh. So and the thing is, I was doing keto up to that point. I did. I dropped um, 60 pounds, I think, right up wow. right before. And it was still, it just filled the whole canal. So they, um, they had to do stuff with the discs. They removed a disc. They widened another canal. Um, but it still took six months before the pain was gone. I couldn't even do PT until after that point. Wow. Uh, but I didn't know what this did to my body. I had no idea. I mean, all I'm just like, Give me whatever's going to take rid of this pain, I don't care. And it didn't. See, I was still, it made it, it brought it down to like an eight or a nine, enough so I could walk and go to work. And I just, I, I looked at my daughter. I said, I'm not depressed. I said, but I'm existing. I says, I'm not living. And I says, I will not live this way. And at that point I was losing hope. And I just, I just, I was like, no, I'm existing to be in pain while I'm trying to sleep, to wake up, to be in pain all day. And, and I had to have this cushion to put my legs in a certain position just to lay down. It, it was horrific. And I, that woman that worked on me, she had pulled out, there were so many past life traumatic energy things within me and she was pulling them out and and there was a lot and I had experienced a lot in this life that um I was trying to deal with as well I a lot of a lot of emotional healing but I got through that and I still up until just a year and a half ago I, I literally everything atrophied I used to hike 100 miles a month but I couldn't do anything. So everything just kind of was dying. And then I noticed uh, like hairs coming out by the handfuls, my skin. It's like, I always, everyone always said, you look 20 years younger than you do. I'm like, I'm 59 years old. And it's like, all of a sudden, everything, my skin just rapidly dried up. Mm. And I was just like, my whole life, I never needed lotion. You know, and I'm like, what is going on? And I was like, if this is happening on the outside, what's happening inside me? And I had no idea. And my TSH went up. That's all I looked at. And this is, we need to put you on level with Iroxin. I'm like, okay, that's going to, and plus I was fighting my body, trying to lose weight. And it was, it was a miserable process. So I went on it and I've never had menopausal symptoms. I'm post-menopausal. I've never had them. My mother never did. And I'm taking a pill that's making me have them. And I'm like, I researched it and I was like, this is a hormone thing. I didn't know what TSA, I didn't know anything. And I oh, hell no. So I took myself off it. It only been a few weeks. And then I did a deep dive and it said, well, just because your TSH is up doesn't necessarily mean you need meds. 
And I was like, okay, this is good. It says, however, you need to test for Hashimoto. So I says, okay. I asked my doctor, can you please test me for Hashimoto? She did. I didn't expect to have it, but I did. My numbers were over a thousand. It didn't tell me how much, it just said over a thousand. And which scared the hell out of me because I'm like, well, they're only supposed to be one. <laughs> I'm like a thousand. I didn't realize at the time people had, I know I met a woman that had over 10,000. She got wow. rid of them. Oh yeah. She got rid of them. And I'm like, okay, what did you do? And she says carnivore. And I would never in my life, I was one of those people. I was like, oh, I can't do I can't give up everything. Eat just me. I don't even like me. I'm like, I'm like, how do I do that? So I didn't, I, I kind of, I was like a keto war for a while, but I read studies. I listened to Dr. Barry mostly in the beginning, then Dr. Sybis, uh, Dr. Shafee. Um, I read book after book after book, The Intermittent Guide to Fasting. Um, all Jimmy Moore stuff, but we won't talk about him. <laughs> that is a whole other story. And I, I, I got to know him personally. So, oh goodness. Oh, oh goodness. Well, yeah, yeah. D different bag of worms. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I learned a lot. All these books and I got all this information because I mean, that's what I did in college. I'm like, I research, I absorb and I, um, I just took it all in. I absorbed and I, then I went into groups and I wanted to learn from people that had Hashimoto. I wanted to know what they did. And I understand everybody's different but I wanted to know the common denominator and it was carnivore. And, but fasting was in my head. I knew intuitively, I said, the only way I'm gonna heal my body is at a cellular level. And I needed yep. to do that. And at the same time too, I've been suffering two years with hypokalemia because, and I didn't know why I'm taking 7,500. Hypokalemia? Super low potassium. Okay. Up in one of the blood tests, they called me within an hour. This is, oh my God, how's your heart? How's your head? Are you okay? I went, I'm perfectly fine. What's wrong with you? <laughs> and so they immediately, 7,500 milligrams of potassium a day. These are five of those horse pills a day. And you have to spread them out. So, and the doctor wanted me on six. The insurance said no. So I'm doing two in the morning, three at night, something like that. And I'm like, how do I, how do I fast with this? I says, I have to take these pills, but you cannot take them on an empty stomach. So I had figured out it was like a 16 or 18 hour thing. And I did them within a six hour time frame, which you're not supposed to do. And you're not even supposed to fast. I'm like, do not fast if you get thyroid stuff. Do not fast if you're hypokalemic. I'm like, but I want to heal. <laughs> and your intuition was telling you to fast. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It was screaming at me. And so I did that. I said, I can't, I have to go this way. I know everything is saying go that way, but I'm like, I need to go this way. So I did. And within, I want to say three months, I started feeling all these symptoms. Like my muscles felt weird. I felt, I felt beautiful when I was fasting. As mm -hmm. soon as I the potassium, I didn't feel right. And so I called the doctor. I said, look, I, I, I know this sounds odd and I have the symptoms of low potassium, but I never had symptoms when I was low potassium. So I don't know what's going on, but I think I have too much. And so I need to drop it. And she goes, okay. She goes, drop it by one. We'll check it in a month. I went a week and I went, and it, it's it, no, it, I need to drop it again. So for five weeks, I dropped it every week. I dropped a pill and then I got tested and I tested myself in the process of this and it I would be so what uh, were you eating at that point I was mostly meat meat and fat and pickles that's why I call it ketovore because I kept having pickles like with the burgers and stuff um every now and then at a broccoli or at the very beginning I was having a lot of carrots but not much it was mostly meat got um, it go ahead sorry I, I didn't mean to interrupt no it's okay I um I did the blood testing while I was like 18 hours fasted and I'm like, if something's going to drop, it's going to drop. <laughs> I, my numbers were normal. So I dropped the pill again. My numbers were normal. I dropped the pill. So at the end of like five weeks, I'm not taking potassium. And, and as soon as I got it down to two pills, I'm like, okay, I can do 24 hours now. And so then I'd go get 
tested at 24 hours fasted, my number's still normal. And I'm like, okay. I says, I don't think I need this anymore. And so I just, I stopped taking it. And then I could do 48 hour fast. Now this wasn't all the time I was staying eating. And then I would do maybe once a week of 48, you know, once every couple months, it was like a 72. Cause I heard, I mean, I just wanted the autophagy benefits. Um, so then it was like, okay, that's gone. This is good. That's gone. I'm, I'm on the right track. And I was talking to my doctor. I says, I need for thyroid. I says, I need, you know, T4, T3, free T4, free T3, reverse T3, and the two antibodies. And uh, um, I'm you know, globulin peroxidase, something like that. I says, I need these. And she's like, um, what are those? And I said, well, that's how I'm going to be able to gauge. Because I did so much research. I know how to read them. I said, I need to know if what I'm doing is helping me or hurting me. And she says, okay. So it's going to cost you a fortune, but she put it under the diagnosis of Hashimoto. I've never paid a dime. And so she did it. And every three months I asked her at, at about the six or nine month mark, she was like, I, you, you should see an endocrinologist. I don't feel comfortable with the insurance company asked me why I'm doing this. I don't even know. And so I said, I'll see an endocrinologist. So I went and he talked a good game. He talked a lot, but he didn't do much. And he tested TSH and T4. I showed him my tests already. And um, he says, well, no, it looks like, he says, you know, Hashimoto has nothing to do with what you eat. And he said, and you're gonna have this for life. So, you know, we'll just, we'll, we'll gauge it. And I'm looking at him like, what? <laughs> I'm like, okay, whatever, appointment done. And I kept doing the testing. And he, at one point he was like, no, I'm just going to do TSH T4. I said, well, I need to know if the reverse T3 has changed in the past six months because it was really high. And he goes, that's an inactive protein. You don't need that. I went, it's an inactive protein that blocks the active protein. I said, I need the active protein. And he goes, where are you getting all this? Uh, I says, are you kidding me? I'm like, you first, I'm being put on a T4 medicine. I said, my T4 was fine. My T3 was low. I said, that's why I reacted the way I did. I said, so now at this point, it's all without medication and my numbers are getting better. And he's just like, you know, this might not be a good fit. I went, you think? (laughs) So I haven't talked to him since. And I went to my doctor and I said, look, I said, I just need you to work with me. I said, I can can try and go to a functional medicine person. I'm, I'm like, I just need you to work with me. And she's like, Okay, when she realized I wasn't paying for all these tests too. She was okay. She was just don't ask me to interpret those tests. I went, I won't, I don't need you to. I just need the numbers. And so she runs them. And everything, Mahashimoto has is down to like 352 now. And it's almost gone. I mean, but I wasn't pure. I mean, in the fall, the whole sugar thing, I got hooked on like the sugar-free. I started replacing everything making it sugar-free that led to sugar and that went down a rabbit hole for a few months. So I lost in the 17 months, I lost like six months of it Mm. because of that six months of progress. And then in January, I had set up a thing with the school. I'm like, Hey, who wants to get ready for summer? You know, thank God, because I was on sugar for, you know, mid October through December. And that one thing I had set up, I went, I can't look stupid. I have to do this. I jumped right back into carnivore, pure. I said, I'm, this is going to be pure carnivore. No mm. vegetables, no, I, cause I, I can't touch anything sweet. It can't be sugar free. It can't be fruit, nothing. Cause it just makes me want more. And that makes my mind kick in. And I'll tell people, I'm like, when you're beginning, listen to lots of motivational audiobooks, drown out that sugar mind and stay very, very busy. As then after a few weeks, the physical cravings are gone and then the mental cravings will come in, but you can handle those. You just have to develop different coping mechanisms um, and not because the main one is eating sugar to bury it. <laughs> so yeah. you don't do yeah. that. And so I'm doing all this blood work and I hadn't had cholesterol checked in it's been two years because we forgot the year before. <laughs> I don't know how she forgot, but she did. And so I was a little scared because I know what everyone else is saying about their numbers. And I'm like, 
well, I've never had a problem with cholesterol, but let's see what this is. And my triglycerides had dropped. They're 61. Um, HDL went up. It's only 52. It's not where it needs to be. LDL is 88. But after reading cholesterol clarity, I'm like, I'm worried at this point because my total cholesterol is 153. That's a wee bit low for a carnivore. Yeah. yeah. And low cholesterol can cause you to have a massive heart attack, you know, and has. In that book, they showed there was some celebrity guy. He was 110 for his total. And they, um, the doctor was like, oh, keep going. You're doing great. And then he dropped dead of a heart attack and they're all stumped. It's because it was too low. Your body has to have it. And so I'm now, I mean, I've been taking um, the omega threes and stuff. So I'm like, well, maybe I shouldn't be taking omega threes. Maybe I don't need omega threes and that's to help cholesterol. <laughs> and so I'm like, okay, I need to get rid of these. Cause I mean, I input a lot of meat, a lot of butter every single day, except when I'm fasting and I'm like, maybe that's the key. You know, I haven't quite figured that part out yet. Yeah. It's like Hashimoto's almost gone. The hypothyroid is gone. Those numbers are fine. Um, Hy- what I, I don't want to interrupt you, but um, I, we do have to end the meeting. Oh, yeah. But um, I want to know, um, I'm just really curious about your sciatic pain. It's gone. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. If I eat something though, like seed oils, like the other day I had um, roast beef. I don't, I haven't done cold cuts in forever, but I wanted roast beef. So I had it and I woke up in the morning with the, an ache in that area and neuropathy in my left foot. Cause I feel like where the pain was in the left butt all the way down my leg and it wrapped around my foot. That's where the pain, all of that was a pain. It's the root and that's numb. And I'm like, I don't care if it's numb because the pain's gone. It must've gotten numb from the surgery, but I could feel that it, it was gone in my foot and I could feel it. So I was like, okay, cold cuts, cold cuts are out because <laughs> whatever they put in them. Um, but yeah, that's all gone. That's amazing to have that severe of pain and, and the Hashimoto's and I mean, everything that you said, I can't believe it. Like, it's just absolutely amazing. But I, what I love about your story is that you didn't just use one modality. Like no, you, no. it was very important for you to do that energy work because that energy work allowed you to clear your mind, to be able to have the inner clarity, to be able to get to the answer. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's the- amazing. <laughs> my granddaughter is what spurred it on. It's like her, uh, she born under a pound, you know, and she fought, she lived through at least four or five different things that would have taken any baby's life. And she lived and thrived. And, um, I looked at her cause I was so full of edema. I was, I couldn't barely walk or breathe, or I was so full of pain everywhere. And I just looked at her and I went, if she can do that, I can mm. do that. And, and it was, that was the turning point, you know? I love it. I love it. Thank you so much, Sally, for coming to this meeting and for sharing. Please come back anytime you want to, because I know I can just feel that there's more to your story. Um, And uh, I know that this story is going to change so many people's lives and help them. Um, Yeah, I do too. I do too. Um, but thank you guys so much, um, for, for coming. And, um, I always love these conversations and I never know what we're going to talk about, but it's always amazing. It always (laughs) blows my mind. So thank you guys. Have a good Saturday. Bye. Hey, I hope you enjoyed the group. Um, there is always, uh, so much beauty in being transparent and in really recognizing that we're all not alone on this journey. Um, And so if you want to feel free to join the Saturday um, support groups, Um, they're every Saturday at 11 a.m. Central Standard Time. And if you need more individualized care, um, then reach out to me and email me at innerclaritysystem at gmail.com. And I would love to walk through and show you what it looks like to work with me one-on-one. All right. Thanks.